Hey everyone, welcome to Martaloop Church. I hope you're doing well in the middle of all of the ongoing pandemic strain. And if you're not, and you're uh, feeling a little surrounded by the stress, I hope that today's message will help. Today we're going to talk about how to hold on. How to hold on when life is threatening to overwhelm you. Or when you're feeling surrounded and restricted and hemmed in. Uh, when life, uh, when it feels like the walls that are building and surrounding and founding your life are starting to crack and uh, everything uh, seems to be out of control. Um, those places where you feel all of those things and you also feel pretty helpless to change the situation. So today we're going to talk about how to hang on in that kind of place. And we're going to do that by meditating on an Old Testament psalm, Psalm 46. The psalms, they say, are the most human words and writings in the Bible. They are raw, emotional, honest. They often articulate things that uh, we can't find words for or are unable to say, or too afraid to say, or unwilling to say. And so very often, the Psalms do that saying in a very real and eloquent and timely way, a, a real faith-building way. And this is what the Psalms are like, and that is why I read them over and over and over again day after day, year after year, decade after decade, I've been reading the Psalms every day. Uh, so much so that uh, I'm now beginning to see uh, how deeply they have shaped my thinking, my mind, and I believe made me just a little bit more Christ-like. Um, which, come to think of it, um, Jesus would have read these exact same psalms. And he quoted the psalms, and his life was shaped by the psalms. And so if I want to be like him, if we want to be like him, then I think we want to be about reading what he read and being shaped by what shaped him. So today, we're going to talk about Psalm 46, a psalm that my mom, I remember uh, since I was a little kid, always telling me was her father, my grandfather's favorite psalm. Of course, when I was younger, I didn't really understand what that meant. I guess I equated the idea of it being my grandfather's favorite psalm with the thought of him, you know, maybe liking the theme or the word choice or admiring the poetry of Psalm 46. But <clears throat> thinking back to his life, uh, that he was a teenager living through World War I, and then through World War II, living in Nazi-occupied Holland with a young family in his 40s, he would have read this psalm. I now wonder if Psalm 46 was his favorite for a much, much deeper reason. And so I called my mom this week and I asked her why was it his favorite. And while she wasn't quite sure, um, and as she was pondering the question, she said this to me about a time when she was a teenager and she asked her father how he knew that God was real. And he responded, and then she said it to me in Dutch, um, which my dad had to then translate, uh, with uh, this phrase. He said, it's, it's what I trust and depend on. For all my life, it's what I trust and depend on. And so for him, I'm thinking, in great part, Psalm 46 was a poignantly articulated, in a way that deeply resonated with his life, um, a poignant articulation of what he trusted and depended on. It was a statement of faith in times when he was literally surrounded by enemy armies and was actually, his life was actually being threatened by war. And he was in a place where he truly needed to hold on, to hold on for dear life. And these are the words he held on to. 
God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. And God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. And he says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Please uh, join me in a prayer. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, uh, we pray that now in this moment you would help us uh, through the words of Psalm 46 to be still and know that you are God. And then in that knowing, find all that we need for life, the moment of life we're living right now, the place where we're feeling hemmed in right now, the trial that we're facing right now. May you be more real to us by a work of your Holy Spirit than you've ever been. Open our eyes so that we can see reality for what it is. And through the words of a psalm meditated upon, be present to us, we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray this. Amen. Feminist theologian Catherine Lacuna once wrote this, that rendering praise to God does not mean simply directing piously exaggerated words toward God in heaven. The act of praise involves the very life of God within us. Words and gestures are, of praise are performative. Their utterance makes actual the glory of God to which they refer and which they intend. By naming God as recipient of our praise, like this psalm does, we are redirected away from ourselves toward God. So when we say words that recognize and praise God for who God is, we make actual the glory of God. When we read a psalm like Psalm 46, a psalm that names the reality of God's presence, God's powerful presence to us in times of trouble, we make actual in some beautiful, mystical, mysterious way God's presence. And it's true, isn't it? When we say or read or hear words like this, they remind us of the truth. And then something inside of us goes, oh yeah, I remember, this, this is the truth, this is what I believe. And then something deeper inside of us, God's Spirit whispers, come on now, you remember this, this is true. And in that moment of Spirit-nudged remembering, Something happens that makes what you're saying or reading or hearing more true, more present, more palpable, more real. So God is your refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. 
Now, can you feel those words lifting you up? God is your stronghold, your strength. God is a here-to-help-ever-presence kind of God. And right now, in the middle of the trouble that you're facing or the strain or stress you're carrying, right now, God is with you. Now, often when I read the Psalms, um, I'll read them the way they're written, but then in meditating about over them, and usually it's a verse or two that strike me, I'll repeat them and repeat them again, and sometimes I'll even personalize them in the rereading. So that same verse becomes, God is my refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Now, Say those words to yourself. Now, can you feel it? Someone once wrote those words, a real human being going through something in their life at that time. Someone felt the way you feel. So you're not alone, like reading a book and the author kind of gets you. I mean, the author kind of gets you. And the author authored those words in the first place. The Holy Spirit inspired the writing of those words. We believe this about Holy Script. Inspired those words knowing that you and so many others throughout history might, might need them one day. And that these words coincide uh, in such poignant and beautiful ways at times with what's happening in your life, it, it's God's way of showing that he holds it all. He holds all of you, all of life's circumstances. And, and one way he does that when you're reading your psalms is providing just in time words of encouragement and joy and hope. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. We will not fear. And there's something about saying that to yourself before that, God, when catastrophe is striking, when natural calamities hit, when, pa when a pandemic rages on. We will not fear. We heard last night on the news that people with Down syndrome are four times more likely to get sick from COVID and ten times more likely to die from COVID if they get it. We will not fear because God is with us. God, God is with us. And when we verbally or cognitive, cognitively reclaim that fact, we do reappropriate it, and we're then able to stand on it and, and to know and receive God's ever-present strength in that place. And in that strength can say with more confidence, we shall not fear. Of course, we all know this. There's nothing like the presence of another to help us through our fears, right? Uh, whether it was a friend when you were a little kid going into that scary place or sleeping in the scary basement by yourself with your brother or sister, or maybe a life partner who is a constant reminder from God that you are not alone in all of this, or maybe it's your family or a faith community who've always said to you, we've got you, you're one of us, you're not alone. Or maybe even on a larger scale, your community or city or country with massive resources and supports to help you in your time of need. God with you through pandemic supports or hospital health care supports or mental health supports. And so, yeah, words spoken in faith, like Lacuna wrote, can be performative in terms of making actual the glory of God, but so too can actions, and all of these actions through all of these means, be proofs and, and ways of performing or making actual the glory of God. I mean, all those people, anyone who's ever helped you in a time of struggle is one of those acts. 
they, they were living psalms. God's embodied spoken words of comfort to you at that time. God's health care or governmental words of support and healing in that time. And through each of those divine image bearers, persons or institutions, God was whispering words of hope to you, that he's got you in that troubled place, saying to you through their very presence, as though God were present, I'm here. I'm here with you. You do not need to be afraid. You do not need to be afraid because there's a river. <laughs> there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. And God is within her, and she will not fall. And God will help her at the break of day. Like Helm's Deep, God will help her at the break of day because there's a river, a source of sustenance meant for your life, a hidden stream. And, and at the break of day, and at the break of every day, the first thing every morning, you know, maybe when you awake and the depression or the heaviness is deepest or, or most weighty, or when the, first, the fear first hits as you're waking up and you remember, oh my, this is where my life is right now. God's help is there at daybreak every day for you. Some theologians think that Psalm 46 historically might have originally been written in response to the events that played out in the life of King, Heze king Hezekiah, Israel's king in the 7th century BCE. And there were two times in Hezekiah's life uh, where he came close to losing his life. Um, one time was when the city of Jerusalem was surrounded by the world superpower Assyrian army and was about to be decimated and ransacked, where God, uh, by the power of God, in a way that only God could do this kind of saving, saved the city by sending an angel of death into the Assyrian army camp and killing 185,000 soldiers, such as the power of God who, who promises to keep you and I. And the other time for Hezekiah was when it looked like he was about to die um, physiologically because of an illness that he was facing. And the story goes like this. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. And the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, this is the prophetic message none of us really ever want to hear. Um, this is what the Lord says, Hezekiah, put your house in order because you're going to die, you will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I've walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. I've heard your prayer and seen your tears, and I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord, and I will add 15 years to your life. And I will deliver you from this city, from you and this city, from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant, David. In, in Hezekiah's most helpless times, God intervened in a way that only God could intervene to save him to save him and to save his people and to save his city. And God's actions in those healing moments of power, God's saving word spoken into and through history made actual the glory of God. 
which kind of then fits those middle verses of Psalm 46, right? Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. And he does. One word from God and world superpowers fall. He lifts his voice uh, and everything on earth will melt. And he does make wars and personal trials and pandemics and attacks cease. And so my grandfather, he lived through two world wars and he literally saw, in faith, God making wars cease. World wars cease. He saw Nazi bows being broken and spears being shattered. And surely, uh, after those wars, he would have remembered God's faithfulness in those perilous times in his life for the rest of his life, which would, I guess, make a lot of sense then in terms of Psalm 46 being his favorite psalm for all of his life. And somehow, that's how psalms work. Um, not just in the speaking of them, uh, God's presence is made palpable, his glory actual, but also they help us to remember. Um, not just remember the stories of previous generations or, or, or the biblical generations, but to remember our own stories as well, where God has been faithful in the past. And this, this happens all the time when I read the Psalms. When I read about this or that in a Psalm, and then I remember that a very similar this or that happened in my life, in that moment, I then say this, what I'm reading in the psalm, is that what I'm living right now? And there's just something about recalling all of those stories and remembering well, a huge word in the scriptures. Remember, remember, remember who I've been in your life, God says. That, that gives us the faith that makes maybe a former faith or a died out or a, or a, a, a quenched faith or a very stepped upon faith come alive again for today. Chapter 11 of the New Testament book of Hebrews is, is kind of the classic example of that kind of remembering power. It, it starts with these words. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And then the long chapter goes on to list story after story of God's faithfulness through so many lives over generations. It starts with God's faithfulness in creation and sustaining creation, and then talks about Abel and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and then moves on to Joseph and Moses' mother, Jochebed, and the prostitute Rahab, and then story after story after story and then concludes with, with these words. Therefore, since we, and this is we, the audience of the writer of the Hebrews, but this is we, us, this is we, you, and we, me. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of faith. I mean, the one who likely would have memorized Psalm 46. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Consider this Jesus who came to you to be God with you, who has put his promised Holy Spirit into you to be God with you. 
he lived a fully human life and he knows what it's like to be in the place that you're in. The opposition, the, the, the pain, the fear of death or loss. You do, we do not have a God who cannot empathize with us. He can and he does and he is with you. Right now, he is with you. Beside you, before you, above you, around you. And right now, he says to you, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. And I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The Lord Almighty is with you. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Please uh, join me in a prayer. So by your Holy Spirit, make that withness real, we pray. And for those who are feeling extreme anxiety or fear or discouragement or doubt or depression, may the power of a love that comes through your presence bring about a resurrection of those broken states into a new, more hopeful, joyous, at peace, shalom way of being. For all of us, wherever we're at, trying to be uh, good people and, and to walk in your way, Jesus. May the sense of knowing that you're near, that is born out of a being still before you, uh, give us all the wisdom and understanding and knowledge that we need to, to tread this life on this planet for these few years you have us here and may uh, extraordinary uh, things come into the ordinary things of our life uh, because you're here be the answer to all of our questions be our reason when we're looking to understand be um, the everlasting love that you are, Lord, um, to all of our beings, we pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
hopefully I'm not giving away too many trade secrets here. But a couple weeks ago, we were at staff meeting, and the team was talking, and one of the things that came up was just how sometimes John and I will go to come to the church and record the service, but before we get here, we're already drained. It's like as soon as we walk out the door, just our energy and our joy is just sucked from us. And we're just dead before we even do what we came to do. And then this week, um, John and I were talking about the message, and I suggested this song, and he agreed, so I started preparing it, and then same thing, I went to leave to come to the church and just got immediately tired and immediately weak. And then it wasn't until I showed up and started trying to record that I realized how apt this message is for just such occasions, especially the first chorus. It goes like this. And even when my strength is long I'll praise you And even when I have no song I'll praise you Even when it's hard to find The words louder than I'll sing Your praise I'll only sing church. Should the mountains crumble and fall into the depths of the sea? Should our social structures crumble and fall into the depths of the sea? Should our joy and our motivation and our strength crumble and fall into the depths of the sea? be still and know that you are God. Go forth to love and serve the Lord. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week.